Um, so, so some, some of the key changes that, uh, that did happen with tax reform, and these aren't necessarily specific to expats, but they affect all Americans, so I thought I'd go through them a little bit. Um, so one, uh, the child tax credit was increased to 2,000 per child, uh, up from 1,400 per child, so that's a, that's a pretty big increase. Um, also, the phase out uh, threshold went up to 200,000 for single individuals and 400,000 for, for uh, married filing joint individuals. So that basically means if you go, if you ha have over a certain income level, they start reducing the amount of, for of child tax credit you can get. And so those limits are now 200,000. So if you're single at 200,000, they'll start reducing the $2,000 uh, child tax credit. And this is something that I think is also uh, you know, very useful for Americans abroad is that they increased the standard deduction to 24,000. So the, the, the way, and, and, and I'm gonna talk about the next thing really quick, which is they also eliminated personal exemptions. So the way it used to work is you, you got a standard deduction of this, let's say 12,000, and just to keep the math simple, for yourself and your children, you would get a personal exemption of, let's say, 4,000, right? So if it's you and one child, you'd get 8,000 worth of, of exemptions, and that would leave you, you know, with 20,000. Uh, and if you made less than that amount of money, you wouldn't be required to file a tax return in the U.S. But if, you know, maybe your kids are out of the house or something like that, you're stuck with this 12,000, and uh, that's what you would have to pay uh, you know, if you went over that threshold, you'd have to pay tax. So now that they increased it to 24,000, it's really increased threshold for even having to file a tax return. Because if you, if you made under 24,000, you, you're not required to file in, in the U.S. Because the standard deduction would eat up all of your income anyway, so there's no need for you to have to file. Which, that is something I think that's beneficial for people that, uh, you know, don't have really high incomes. Another thing, and this didn't affect Americans abroad so much, but they did repeal uh, the personal mandate of Obamacare. So, you know, everybody was required to have health insurance before, and if you didn't, there were all these penalties. So they got rid of that. That no longer exists, so there's no penalties for um, not having health insurance. So I mean, it'll help a little bit with taxes, one less form that you have to file. Uh, for anybody that's gotten divorced, alimony is now tax exempt. Uh, get that tax free. So if you're thinking about getting divorced, you might have tax benefits now. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and this is one that I think does affect a lot of expats that are either have recently moved abroad or are thinking about moving, uh, is they did get rid of the moving expense deduction. So if you're moving, you can no longer deduct the, the expenses related to moving. They also got rid of most of the itemized deductions. So, um, one of the one of the things for most of you probably know is you have to choose between the standard deduction, so this twenty four thousand, or your itemized deductions. You get to choose one of the two, whichever's more. So, if the twenty four thousand standard deduction is more than all of your itemized deductions added up together, you're better off with the standard deduction. If all your itemized deductions added up together are more than like the $24,000, you would be better off with the itemized deductions. But now they've eliminated a lot of these itemized deductions. So unreimbursed employee business expenses. So you know things like license, regulatory fees, tax preparation fees, home office expenses, all not deductible anymore. Um, uh, they, uh, they did lower the threshold for deducting medical expenses. So it used to be that your medical expenses had to be more than 10% of your adjusted gross income in order to be able to deduct them. They lowered that to 7.5%, which is what the old threshold used to be years ago. But the state and local income tax deduction is now capped at 10,000. So if you, you know, have income from the states and a state that charges income tax and you're paying more than 10,000 in income tax in any of those states, uh, whatever's over 10,000 will be lost. Uh, mortgage interest used to be deductible on mortgages up to a million dollars. They've now lowered that that the mortgage interest is only deductible on properties up uh, on mortgages up to seven hundred fifty thousand. And interest on home equity loans is no longer deductible. Um, 
A couple of things. This is so. This this would affect business owners. So I'm sure a lot of you guys saw on the news that they passed a one-time repatriation tax. That you know the big companies in, in the U.S. now have to pay this one-time tax on all the billions of dollars that they saved overseas and didn't pay taxes on. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is this also could affect expats that operate businesses through foreign companies. So if you, let's say, operated a small business through a Swiss company, so you had a Swiss GmbH that you were operating a business through, technically that would be considered a foreign corporation if it's more than 50% owned by U.S. shareholders. So if you're a U.S. citizen and you own more than 50% of this foreign company, it would be considered a controlled foreign corporation. And any retained earnings, so basically any profits that that company had not distributed and retained in the company over the years, you would have to pay a 15.5% deemed repatriation tax on it. So this was something that really negatively impacted expats that you know, it was an unintended consequence of um, Tax reform. It was it was a law aimed to you know tax all these deferred profits of uh, you know Apple and Google and all these companies, but it, it does impact expats if they were operating businesses through you know foreign corporations. So if any of you operate businesses, be mindful of this that you know there is this one time deemed expatriation tax, uh, and you could be subject to it. Uh, one good one of the good news is is one of the good news is it's not even a word. <laughs> One item of good news is that you don't have to pay the tax at all at once. You could break it up over eight years, uh, but still, it's just you know it's more tax. Uh, another thing, and this is again something that would affect uh, Americans running you know businesses uh, over you know through a foreign corporation, is the new guilty tax. Uh, so if you're, <laughs> you might be guilty of guilty. Um, and basically, it, it, it used to be possible that if you had an active business, so I, I don't know, let's just say you owned a bike shop and it was in a Swiss GmbH or some type of foreign company. And that bike shop was generating, say it generated 100,000 in profits. And at the end of the year, you decided I'm not gonna take any of the 100,000 out of the company, I'm just gonna leave it in there because uh, I don't need the money right now, I'll take it out later. It used to be that you wouldn't have to pay any U.S. income tax on that 100,000 profit that was left in the foreign company. That's how Apple and Google and all these places avoided all that tax. They now changed the law, however, and they said if any income that's not from tangible property, so if it's not from real estate basically, like rental income, that you have to pay tax on the income of the foreign company regardless of whether you actually get the money. So you could have this foreign company and have the 100,000 in it, not take it out, but you still have to pay tax on the 100,000 even though you didn't get it. So there are a couple of planning techniques that can help ease the burden a little bit, uh, but there's just something to be mindful of for, for business owners or any Americans that you know that might be business owners in, in a foreign country. Um, so the passport rev revocations. So this, this is something that I, 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 I'm very sad to see because it really doesn't give Americans a, a, a lot of protections. So they passed this law in 2015 that if you have a seriously delinquent tax debt, um, that they can either revoke or deny your, uh, your U.S. passport. And a seriously delinquent tax debt when this law was first passed was 50 grand. Now it's, they upped it for inflation, it's $51,000. And, yeah. And that might sound like a lot of money when, when you're talking about a, a delinquent tax debt, you know, it kind of makes you think like, okay, you know, is this is somebody that owes tax and you know, even if they owe tax, getting up to 50,000 might be kind of difficult, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this can actually be uh, more troublesome than, than you might think. Um, so the way this basically works is if you have a seriously delinquent tax debt, the IRS sends a notice to the State Department saying this person owes us money, and then they 
revoke or will deny the renewal of your passport. Uh, the first revocation started this year. Uh, now, what's, what's scary about this is if the IRS denies or revokes your passport, you have no right to appeal that. So the only way, you know, normally, for example, if the IRS says you owe money or you're audited or you have some kind of dispute, you have the ability to appeal that with the IRS and argue your case. You don't have that with the passport revocation. The only option you have is to sue the IRS. So you have to hire a lawyer and sue them to try to argue it, which is obviously very costly. So I mean, if you couldn't afford to pay your taxes, probably you know, paying a lawyer to sue the IRS is not really gonna be an option. And what I find so scary about this is that there are certain situations where you might not even owe the IRS money, but they can claim you do and it would be considered a seriously delinquent tax debt. So if, for example, the IRS, let's say you were to get audited, and the IRS thinks that you maybe owe more than $50,000, they could just say, well, we think that you owe $100,000 and make what's called a jeopardy assessment that you guys can then fight about through the audit process. But once they do that, you technically owe the money. And they can go do the passport revocation. So just something to, to be mindful of because the only way uh, you know, to get it back is then either to sue them or uh, agree to pay it. Yeah? I assume revoking the passport is not revoking the citizenship. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, no, no, no. It's not, it's not revoking the citizenship. It's the, it's, it's the passport. But, you know, what, what, what's really troublesome about it is you know, if you were in a foreign country and they revoked your passport and you tried to travel, they're gonna deport you back to, to exactly. the US. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, yeah, just something to be, to be mindful of. Um, and so this is kind of talking about, uh, you know, c compliance. And, and you know, I, I think everybody here is, knows you have to file taxes and you know, knows the things that, that need to be done. Um, but one of the things that, that happened early this year uh, is that the, the very first way for people to get into compliance that weren't was through this offshore voluntary disclosure program. And this was, this, this was kind of uh, unfortunate the way the IRS first implemented this because this program was really geared towards people that were kind of intentionally did something wrong, right? Like the people that were hiding, like the Americans hiding money right here in Switzerland and intentionally not putting it on their taxes. So not most expats, right? And the unfortunate part was, at the time this originally came out, like in 2009 was the first version of this, um, there were still a lot of Americans that didn't know that they needed to file taxes, they were unaware of their obligations, uh, and the only way for them to get back into compliance was to basically go through this program and pay, like I think back then it was like a 15 or 20% or 25% penalty, I don't remember what the penalty was, but to basically pay this penalty to get back into compliance, even though most of them didn't owe any taxes, they didn't even know they were supposed to file. And over the years, the IRS realized that, you know, this was really unfair, and they started introducing like the streamlined procedure and some of these different amnesty programs where, you know, expats could get back into compliance without having to pay any penalties. And these programs have now existed, you know, they've changed a little bit, but like I said, this came out in 2009, then there was you know, some additional programs that came out in 2012, 2014, and they've slowly been amended and changed and morphed and people have taken advantage of them. Well, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of um, been a little bit of, uh, I think a lot of people, some people have gotten into a false sense of security. I know I've seen a lot of clients that have, I know I've seen a lot of clients, or not clients, but people that, I've had consultations with that have kind of been like, well, you know, it doesn't seem like the IRS is really doing anything in terms of non-compliant people, uh, so I'm just not going to do anything. And you know, I can always do the OBDP or a streamlined procedure or something later. And earlier this year, the IRS announced that, um, you know, we've had these programs, this OBDP program, open long enough. 
people who've known about it, if they haven't taken advantage of it by now, uh, they had their opportunity and you know, now they don't have one anymore after September 28th of this year and we're gonna start going, going after it basically. And so I think that we're gonna start seeing a shift with the IRS that a lot of these other amnesty programs uh, that didn't have penalties are slowly gonna start going away and they're gonna start taking the options away um, for people to get back into compliance without having to pay uh, a penalty. And that basically the only way back in will be to file delinquent tax returns and sort of fall on the sword and see whatever the, the IRS does. And, and another reason why I think this is, this is happening, I, I've, and I've said this at some of the, the, the presentations that I've given uh, to various FACO groups, is you know, a lot of people have asked, well, you know, what's the IRS doing with all this FATCA data? And for years, I've thought that it just went into a black hole and they didn't do anything with it. Because I've literally never seen an audit due to FATCA. I've never seen a penalty assessed due to FATCA. I've never even heard of an audit because of FATCA or a penalty assessed from, from FATCA. And so my thought was, you know, they created this law that all this information is gonna to go to the US and that it's basically just going into a database that they don't have any way to mine or look at and you know, somehow process to determine who's compliant and who's not compliant. Along with, with this, there was about two weeks before they announced the close of the OVDP, they disclosed that they had given the entire fact database to the criminal investigation division of the IRS uh, that has now developed the tools to be able to mine that data, and which they're planning on doing. Uh, so the IRS has, has now said that that is of their, uh, you know, their, their top priority is mining this back of data. So I think uh, we're gonna start seeing a, a more aggressive IRS in terms of, of the, the back of data.